Hello, 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 and welcome to Salon Lockdown. Um, this is our series of big idea salons that we've been doing since the beginning of lockdown. And tonight we're going to be looking at one of the biggest ideas of all time, the idea of the brain with Professor Matthew Cobb. Yes, tonight with Matthew, we're going to be taking <laughs> a whistle stop tour of the idea of the brain through history. We're going to look at the ideas we believe about the brain in the right here, right now. And we're going to take a little look into the future um, because this is exactly what Matthew covers in his extraordinary book called A Masterpiece by Dr Adam Rutherford. Then we'll be opening up for questions and I know we've got a very smart crowd in tonight. <laughs> Hello Barry. Hello Laura. Uh, so please don't hold back when it comes to questions. And um, We've got the question field there. If you put them in there I can put them to uh, Matthew. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Helen Bagnall um, from Salon London and uh, whether we're in a members club or in a literary festival or in a field, uh, all of my work is designed to get us together with really, really big ideas, authors and academics. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good evening and welcome. And I hope that you're doing OK and I hope you're not too hot. Talking of being too hot, Matthew Cobb is up in his baking hot attic. <laughs> Matthew is a professor of zoology at the University of Manchester, uh, where his research focuses on his sense of smell, on insect, be insect behaviour and the history of science. An author as well as an academic, um, as well as the uh, the book, The Idea of the Brain, that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, he's written the scientific, the science books, Life's Greatest Secrets and The Egg and Sperm Race, and also, unusually, two books about the French resistance and the liberation of Paris. So, hello, Matthew. How are you? Hello, Helen. Good to be here. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hope you're all well. How is your brain doing today? Uh, it's frying. <laughs> <laughs> but not literally. I, 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 well, I'm really, <laughs> I, I studied Drosophila, uh, these tiny little insects, and they have insects that are called temperature sensitive, that only do things at certain temperature. Uh, and I'm clearly a, a temperature sensitive mutant because... I, it's far too hot for me. <laughs> well, as I I'll do my best. <laughs> as I found out from reading your book, the time and the temperature uh, um, of outside when you do experiments can have huge effect on the results. I now know this. But um, Matthew, you're, and as I said in the introduction, you're an academic um, as well as a, a, a scientist and historian. Um, I think you're the first scientist that I've interviewed has also written books on the French resistance. Um, so I guess my first question is, why did you think or want to bring history and science together in your book, The Idea of the Brain? Well, I've always been interested in history. Um, I, uh, I, I did English history and biology at A-level. So I was a bit odd then and went on to do uh, psychology at uh, Sheffield University, which was basically kind of Freud plus neuroscience. Uh, it was a very odd period in the early 70s when neuroscience didn't really exist. The term had ba barely been invented. Um, and some of the lectures that I enjoyed the most there were the lectures on the history of psychology and trying to understand things. Uh, and I've always found that to really understand where you are now in science, you need to understand how you got there. Uh, and that is that's also true of organisms. You need to know the individual development of an organism, so how why it is the way it is, but also the evolution of that species. So history is of all kinds is incredibly important. And uh, the idea for writing the book, I think I say in the acknowledgements, I'm not sure whose idea it was. I think it was my then editor John Davy. Um, uh, and initially it was just basically going to be kind of one damn thing after another, just a, a chronological uh, set of things that people have found out down the ages. And it wasn't working. It, you know, the, the book didn't feel right. And then uh, about half, two years in, I kind of realised that, in fact, there was an underlying theme that I hadn't really, I knew was there because I'm interested in, this I the idea of ideas in metaphors, in metaphors that scientists use. And I realized that that was the kind of framework around which I could shape the book and which would be extremely interesting and novel and stop it just being one damn thing after another. <laughs> and it certainly is that. And it, one of the first things that struck me about reading it was how unconsciously or how unquestioningly, unquestioningly we sort of believe that the brain is where thought comes from. Yeah. And um, but it was always it wasn't always so. Um, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about who um, who first identified the brain as the organ for thought. Well, of course, we've got a problem in that we've only got 
a very narrow window of human knowledge. <laughs> we've been around for, I don't know, 300,000 years. And all we really can be confident about is written history. And most of the written history that we've got doesn't actually deal with stuff like what's in the brain or what's how do we think. It deals with much more mundane stuff from early in human history. So the first written evidence we have comes from the ancient Greeks. Uh, and they had two views. They had the view of Aristotle, which was the dominant view, which is that uh, thoughts and ideas are in your heart. Mm. And we can see we can see this in our language. You can see this, uh, he was down at heart, heartbroken, you know, all those pop songs about hearts. That's telling you, that's telling you some of this. It, it's the, it's, it's, it's what uh, archaeologists call a palimpsest. It's a relic, it's a fossil. It's a, it's an, a linguistic, uh, you know, conceptual fossil of how our thoughts and emotions work that goes back to ultimately prehistoric times. And one of the most interesting things that I spent doing, which a lot of which got cut out of the book annoyingly, but I had to compress in, was reading accounts from anthropologists, from uh, various holy books, from around the world, seeing where people, different people thought, thought was. And virtually nobody, in fact, nobody thought it was in the brain. Uh, everybody thought that thought was in your heart, in your guts, in your um, in your kidneys, it's all sorts of odd parts of the, the the body. Or, and I managed to just slip this in uh, in the editing because it suddenly occurred to me. I'd, I'd kind of gone round the world, but there were two areas that I couldn't really get hold of anthropological accounts of. One was Africa, which is you know, obviously a huge continent, not a place. Um, but I found it very difficult to get ideas about what pre-colonial thought was in, in Africa. And the second place was Australia. And I managed to contact some uh, Australian uh, anthropologists who said, you know, I said, so where would Aboriginal people and Torres Island people think that the location of thought was? And basically the answer was they would not understand the question because for them, thought isn't localized anywhere. It's not that it's in the heart or the liver rather than the brain. It's that it's your relationship with the natural world. And it's possible that that was initially how we all thought we were simply part of the landscape. And that very uh, fluid and interactive and you know, non-precise way of thinking about where thought was, was initially what we all dealt with. Anyway, to get back to the ancient Greeks, you've got Aristotle who says it's in the heart and the brain is just a big thing for cooling. Um, and then you have the, the writers who are known as Hippocrates. So Hippocrates is often called the founder of modern medicine. Uh, in fact, there was a whole series of people on the island of Kos, and they started to think that it was something to do with the brain, but they didn't have any reason. And there were even dissections that were done in Alexandria, uh, which is a bit gruesome because these were probably on, I mean, some of them may even have been on live people. It's not quite clear. Um, but these dissections, all, all they really showed was, look, the brain's complicated and the heart looks quite simple. The brain's connected to the eyes and the, all the sense organs, so that makes some kind of sense. But there was no, no way of proving that the brain was actually doing anything different from the heart. So without evidence, you just had two logical arguments. What it must be said is the reason why those heart things carry on and still make sense, and if you try in any of those pop songs replacing the word heart with brain, it just feels stupid and weird, is because that's what it feels like. You know, when you're frightened, you don't feel frightened up here, you feel frightened in your guts, your guts start churning, your heart starts pounding, you start sweating. When you feel happy and excited, it's not simply in your head. And although you might know that thought is in, in your brain, that's not the way it actually feels. And that's, that is one of the interesting things, and it comes back at the end, and maybe we'll get there. If not, I'll get it in now. One of the great discoveries of neuroscience about 20 years ago was a paper that was called The Brain Has a Body, which might seem kind of obvious, <laughs> but it's still forgotten these days that our brain is not just this device floating around and our mind isn't just floating around in there. We are, we are entirely part of our physiology, which is affecting how we feel and our emotions and so on.
Thank you. Amazing answer. Um, Sorry, it was a bit long. <laughs> it's quite a certain... <laughs> it wasn't what you were expecting. <laughs> I'm wondering now how I can much... Read the... <laughs> Why don't I just read the book? <laughs> well, chapter one. <laughs> in this live 1,000-hour salon <laughs> in which we get to grips this. OK, let's, let's get to one of the really big questions and really important um, areas that you cover in the book, um, which is this idea of when did we first begin to think of the brain as a machine? Yeah. Well... I mean, the first person, to, as far as we know, and again, we're always relying on written evidence, and you've got to remember there are a lot of very smart people around the planet thinking all sorts of stuff which we may not know about. The first person, as far as we know, who saw machines and thought there was some kind of analogy he could use was Descartes, the French philosopher, who in the 1630s, he's in Paris, and they had public gardens, and they had these hydraulic robots, so kind of animatronic things that would, you know, a dragon would emerge from the uh, from the undergrowth, and this bloke statue would then walk it on the head with a with a uh, with a stick and stuff like that. A uh, flute player, all sorts of things like that. And Descartes knew these things weren't alive, so he wasn't fooled. But he thought, look, this looks remarkably like the way the, the, you know they're behaving in this eerie way, and. Uh, we know that there are these tubes, these nerves that connect the brain, which has got fluid in it, because we've got things called ventricles, these big holes, gaps in the brain. Now, maybe, he said, what's happening is that there's something going down from the brain, these uh, animal spirits, as they were called, which doesn't mean that they were animals, it's to do with animation, to do with movement. Uh, these m spirits that cause movement go down from the brain into your, into your body, into your leg or wherever. So he was the first person to make that analogy. It's pretty vague. And what's striking, and I mean, it's completely wrong, and people immediately, as soon as his work was published, proved it was wrong by getting a, a nerve and chopping the end of it, and, you know, stuff didn't come spurting out of it like brake fluid or a, an artery or something. There was, you know, there's no fluid in nerves. It doesn't work that way. So people were very quickly able to show that he was wrong about that. But what's striking is that we had those kind of devices in ancient Greece, they had all sorts of amazing wind or hydraulic or weight-driven uh, apparatuses, animatronic devices, and nobody, as far as we know, made the same kind of link that Descartes is. So one of the things about looking at the history of science is you end up thinking, well, that was a bit stupid. <laughs> Why did he think that? And then, oh, my God, that's absolutely amazing. What a breakthrough. And it's the, obviously the same idea is both wrong and absolutely incredible. And the same is going to be true of our ideas now in the future. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. One of the things that keeps occurring when reading the book of which of these ideas are going to be the brilliant ones, which of these ideas are going to be forgotten. It's amazing. Um, talking about one idea that really seems to take hold, it takes hold really tightly and it doesn't let go, is this idea of, I think you call it localization. I think you mentioned it then. But um, I guess the easiest way to understand it is... Um, phrenology almost that idea of you know of, of looking at the picture of a brain on a model and you can see all these different areas marked up of different areas of the brain um, you know I think that's the best description I can give it as a non-scientist but that sort of explains what localization is but this idea that as a part of a brain for each function why yeah. does this take hold so much you know what why is it why won't it go away well uh, I mean probably because it's partly true ah okay <laughs> <laughs> well, now it is. But then, so why did people, so phrenology is this uh, pseudoscience that takes off in the late 18th century, and it builds on physiognomy, which is the idea that, oh, he looks so wrong and his eyes are too close together. In fact, Darwin nearly didn't get on the beagle because Captain Fitz, <laughs> blah, 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 I've forgotten his name, uh, whatever his name was, uh, nearly... He, he was an adept of physiognomy, and he took one look at Charlie's balding pate and said, I don't like you, don't like the look of you. And Darwin had to convince him that he was all right and the world would have been very different. Um, Someone else would so, have done it. Someone else would have written it. Anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, but in a very different way. I mean, Wallace would have had come up with the idea. So that is one of the things about the history of science is that in general, it is extremely overdetermined. So it doesn't ultimate, I mean, people write books about this. People write what if accounts and historians sometimes get quite snotty about it. I think it's actually quite useful. Uh, in that it shows you the ideas are floating around. And you can make that case for history in general, apart from, I don't know, things like 
the Spanish Armada being blown out of the water by a gale or hurricane, whatever it was. Uh, but in the history of science in general, there's so many people doing so many things that it is virtually certain that the discovery will be made. It'll be made in a different way, so history will be different. But anyway, back to physiognomy and, uh, and phrenology. Uh, this idea of basic idea where your face looks odd is then turned into uh, a pseudoscience whereby it's claimed that you can feel the lumps in the brain through the lumps on the skull. Now, there's a problem with this in that the skull is very, very thick, so you can't directly feel the lumps in the brain, and the shape of the brain is not the same as the shape of your skull. So it's complete non-starter. But what it did was to say, say three things. It said, firstly, it's all in the brain. So it very clearly, it kind of cemented, there have been this long period, which we haven't talked about because I've rambled on about other stuff. There have been this long period in which people have been to and fro and about, is it the brain, is it the... Is it, the, uh, is it the heart? And there was no decisive experiment. There wasn't a moment. There wasn't a brain-centric moment where the apple fell from the tree and everyone, went, oh, wow, that's like that. It's a slow accumulation of evidence and kind of gentle confidence that it's this way. And so phrenology says that first and foremost, that it is the brain. Secondly, it says that it's also materialist, that there isn't any weird spirity stuff in there, whatever, however it works, it's based in the brain and it's a material thing finally it says there's localization of function now they got that idea partly because they wanted to be able to it was early psychology they're coming up with um certain traits certain personality traits kindness uh pride for example uh which they think they can localize to certain areas and uh it was also comparative they thought they could find the same idea the same personality traits within limits in an animal as in a human being. So though it wasn't evolutionary, it was comparative. So all those really powerful reasons why it was very, very important, despite being utterly bonkers and completely wrong. What happened was that there was a, a bit of a split between the, the French who for philosophical reasons, because Descartes argued that thought was unitary, and therefore that meant the brain had to be unitary. And so you couldn't have any physical differences and when you look at the brain it's symmetrical it all looks pretty much the same uh they're clearly different areas doing different things but it doesn't seem that thought or personality traits would be localized uh in the uk it took a rather different turn and ended up being a bit like a kind of self-help movement became very radical uh got fused with the old phrenology got fused with the early um, mechanics institutes that were springing up in the working class cities like Manchester, uh, which were self-help and educational groups. So a lot of people believed in this stuff. Every thinker you can think of in the 19th century went for it. The first thing that uh, Moriarty says to Sherlock Holmes when they meet, and that must have been written in, what, 1870, 1880? Uh, he makes a disparaging remark about Holmes's skull on the basis of his shape. Karl Marx loved it. Queen Victoria loved it. So everybody was into phrenology, but it was completely not a rubbish. It's a bit like astrology. You know, you'd read you just for the hell of it. But it doesn't mean anything. What really changed things, however, happened in France. And that was the proof that there was localization of function. And this is the strongest evidence we still have for that. And I'm doing it right now. It's speech. And this was discovered in 1860 by a French uh, surgeon called Broca. Who was carrying out a um, he was carrying out a, a post mortem on a, a man who was generally known as Tan because that's all he could say, uh, who'd had a stroke about 20, 30 years before. He died eventually in Broca's surgery uh, in Broca's uh, hospital ward. Broca investigates, looks at his brain, and he finds that in this part of his brain there's really bad lesions, and he then does does some other investigations, some other post mortem investigations of people who've had strokes and couldn't speak and finds exactly the same thing. And he's terrified because the whole of the French, you know, intellectual establishment says there is no localization of function. This is complete rubbish. All the attempts to prove it have shown there's nothing there. And he ends up kind of driven by the data to end up saying there is this area in the front left hand part of the brain which controls speech. And that's odd because you can't really see it. If you look at the anatomy of the two sides of the brain, it doesn't look any different. And it's also odd because in general, things are in the brain are symmetrical, but this area is only on one side. So that gave people a very clear 
confidence that this area uh, was involved in speech and so there's a localization of function and then later on about 10 years later people started to put electrodes uh, into the brains of dogs and their monkeys and were able to show that there was motor control and even areas that you know the animal's ears would flick and twitch as though it heard something so people gradually became confident that there was localization of uh, of function. Got it. Thank you. Um... <laughs> I, I, you can look, wave at me if I'm going on too long. <laughs> stop! Stop! I really like falling it. asleep out there. I love the way we're still at the 16th century, but <laughs> no, 18th, 18th, late, late, late 19th. 18th, Come yeah. On, Sorry, yeah, we did get there, and I want to stay there just for a little bit longer because I want to explore this idea that you know you do really well. That it's really important how. Um, the ideas of the time that are sort of in the air, you know, not phrenology, we understand that, but, you know, the, the ideas of the time get really bound up with the way that we, we feel about the brain. Um, and I wondered if one of the ways to, to describe that, uh, you do so elegantly, is to talk a little bit about electricity and how, you know, the, how our understanding of electricity suddenly becomes really enmeshed, not only with society and our art, but in the way that we understand ourselves and the brain. Is that a good example, a good one to talk about? No, no, I think absolutely. That's the that's the the first really clear example, apart from Descartes, which you've got you know, Descartes. Had a very limited, <laughs> limited uh, kind of influence. But the electricity does do because, of course, it's right because there is electricity. Our brains do work on a kind of electricity, and by stimulating the brain with electricity, you can produce behaviour. So uh, the first evidence of this comes about in the ninety in the eighteenth century with people uh, using. Uh, very crude methods of kind of a single discharge. So you, you couldn't, batteries didn't exist then, uh, of giving a constant uh, discharge. So you give a, a sudden discharge, you could get you could get monks to jump. So if you get a lot of monks to hold hands, 400 of them, and then you send, you shock the poor guy at the end with one of these very powerful shocks, then the shock goes along, they all jump in order. So it became very obvious that electricity could produce behavior. Uh, and then with the development of uh, batteries, which were amazingly invented by Volta using the electric organs of the electric eel as a model. So our modern batteries are a bit of biomimicry. I had no idea about that. I mean, I know historians of electricity go, well, yeah, 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 it's obvious, but I just think it's absolutely astonishing. Um, that enabled you to produce a constant current. And that meant you could do much more interesting things like get a dead body and put electrodes on either side of its head. And if it is a human, it'll open its eyes, it'll roll them around, it'll grind its teeth. Same thing with a cow. If you get a whole cow carcass, it'll kind of spurt shit across the room. I mean, it was all pretty terrifying stuff. And one young lady who went to see some talks about this, not with a human body, but with animal bodies, uh, almost certainly anyway, at the Royal Institution, um, ended up writing a very famous book about this, which is called uh, Frankenstein. So that was Mary Godwin as she was then, uh, Mary Shelley when she wrote Frankenstein. So this idea of the power of electricity enters into culture and then very quickly with the development of technology like the telegraph, then you end up with these systems of communication going across whole continents incredibly quickly in about 10 years from the development of the final commercial development of the telegraph in about eight, mid 1830s. By the mid 1840s, it's all over the UK. It's beginning to span the USA. It's all over Europe. And you look at a map of a telegraph system and you look at a map of the nervous system and it looks very similar. And people started to use that analogy. In fact, the analogy went both ways. They said, just like the, for our purposes, they were most interested in uh, saying that the brain works like a telegraph system. You get information going up these uh, up these uh, these wires to the brain. But they also said that the country is like a huge body and you've got information coming from the region. It's strange, it's always going to London. But anyway, um, information going up into the capital, which is the head, and coming up, because that's where all the telegraph networks you know, ended up. Thank you. So the telegraph was the really important thing in the middle of the 19th century. And then with the development of the telephone exchange, which is a rather weird device that young people won't actually know about. But if you watch some old films in black and white, you'll see women putting cables across a thing with lots of holes. And the key point about a telephone exchange is that it's very flexible. 
and the telephone exchange then became a metaphor for the brain in about the late 1870s. Uh, and I've st I saw it in an article in Nature Neuroscience about two years ago. Some modern neuroscientists still said, well, the brain's a bit like a telephone exchange, which was bizarre to see this metaphor still floating about. But the idea is you got flexibility. You're not having, you're not like a telegraph system is only going from A to B with a with a uh, the, the telephone exchange, you've got flexibility. You can choose which number you want to dial, which output you want. Isn't there a difficulty with um, using technology to define um, the brain that you're going to be out of date really quickly? <laughs> or is it just so infected with, well, the, with I mean, the way that you understand? Clearly, <laughs> clearly the telephone exchange is still going strong. Uh, the computer, <laughs> which kind of began in the 1950s, uh, you know, people get very cross. I had an article in The Guardian about this and I got lots of, Cross uh, emails and uh, flack on Twitter from fellow neuroscientists going, oh, but why are you saying the brain's not like a computer? Of course it is, and then getting very cross. So neuroscientists care about this stuff. I, I think the point is that biology in particular uses metaphors, but I think all science does. Science has to use metaphors. The only sciences, I think, which don't use metaphors as a way of framing their ideas and their theories is probably uh physics and maths and physics is just kind of applied maths and there literally you have a different language mm. you have a, a language of mathematics which is not you know spoken by the profane like me i can't understand it uh but mathematicians and physicists work in that different level so when they use metaphor they, in fact it's very interesting they tried to get away from metaphors that's why they got those stupid things about quarks up down strange and what you know they're things that don't mean anything because they didn't want deliberately didn't want to find themselves trapped by a metaphor i mean they talk about spin which is weird but they didn't want to find themselves trapped by a metaphor because that's the point about metaphors is that they're a framework they're a framework within which you can understand the world and think about it and all all the rest of it but that framework can become, a, a, you know, a, a prison. It becomes a an obstacle. You can't ha ha think outside of the box. You can't think outside. Can't think of the brain in any other way because you're so imbued with this metaphor. So, as I say, I think it's something that's common to uh, all the non, apart from physics and maths, to all the sciences. But it's particularly strong, I think, in bi biology. This use of metaphor to try and explain things and to provide a uh, a way of developing experimental ideas. Mm. And you mentioned computers. And I hope we get on. I hope we can get onto computers. But I wanted to um, it, it slightly. No, sorry, Matthew. We were. We were. <laughs> It was, um, I wanted to just, it is a related question. I wanted to touch on this idea of the human desire to build a thinking brain, which again, you know, it seems to be very, when I was reading about that, it was really reminding me a lot of the conversations we were having over the last decade about the way computers and AI was going to replace us, yeah. us humans. And I, I was really surprised that that, well, that wasn't a new fear. Um, you no, know. I, I mean, people have been worried about machines. So there was, uh, I mean, these, the early robots were pretty crude, but I, I forgot what it's called. It's not actually in the books. One of the things that got cut, there was a, a robot in the 1930s called John or something who actually killed his creator. He had a gun. I mean, why would he give a robot a gun? <laughs> it's a very crude robot. And obviously the gun went off and poor, you know, Dr. Mad Person fell over dead. Uh, you can find it, look on Google, you know, doc, first robot assassination. Um, but yeah, people have been... You know, the uncanny valley thing, being weirded out by machines, goes way back. And you can find on, on YouTube, there's an amazing thing called the writer. And this is a, uh, uh, it's a clockwork device. It's got 6,000 moving parts. And this little boy sat at a desk and he writes with a quill pen. And you can program him. You can make him write different letters. And those letters form words and make a letter. And his eyes flick back and forth is, is absolutely eerie fantastic go on youtube not now afterwards and uh check out the writer uh it's amazing it's in switzerland if you're in switzerland you're watching from switzerland you can go down and uh, uh have a look at it in the museum so people have been weirded out by machines for a long time that are eerie and look like they might be alive 
<laughs> I know. I, I find them really fascinating, the whole idea. And that, as you say, they're in ancient Greece and I think in the Middle East as well. Just incredible yeah. automata, do they? Autom autom automata, incredible machines. Um, but we've, been, we've done a lot with AI over the last 10 years, you know, as a, yeah. as a community, as a salon community. And we've talked a lot about it. And I remember one um, tech expert saying um, that he, he thought theoretically, and he is a, he's an, he is, he is an expert in AI, um, evolutionary, evolutionary AI. Anyway, uh, and he said that he believed you could theoretically map the human brain. But um, as you will know, the, the, Good luck. Uh, yeah, he said as the human brain has, you know, 90 billion neurons, I think that's an estimate, um, you'd need all the space in the world to kind of put it. And you'd need all the power in the world <laughs> <laughs> that you could get and even then there's a pretty good chance that it wouldn't work and that was for one human <laughs> brain <laughs> yeah yeah i mean there's a lot of um a lot of colleagues uh talk a good talk about this and it you know it gets you a lot of grant money it gets you sexy books um i'm not sure that the most serious of people really think that ai of any kind uh, is shedding light on uh, humans, except in a, a in a rather odd way. Now, I'll I'll, pref I'll explain that. Firstly, there's all the amazing dis things that those deep learning programs that you you read about, so that they can do absolutely astonishing things, recognize things, you know, recognize images in uh, radiography that a human can't see. They can pick things out and they learn how to do things. Astonishing, but. They, the people who make those things do not know how they work. And they cheerfully admit this. We don't know. We have no idea how what's called the hidden layer, which is the basically it's the, the gubbins, the bit between the input and the output, the machine works it out itself. And so you can't kind of unpick it all and work out what's happening. Now, one aspect, I think, and about AI is particularly kind of interesting and pernicious, and it tells us the limits of it, and that's the way it reproduces our prejudice. I'm sure you've all seen uh, that thing that was going around on Twitter yesterday with a, or a few days ago with a highly pixelated picture of Obama, which was clearly of Obama. And then the, the computer, the people who made this thing were really proud because it could, de it could reconstruct the face. Fantastic. It was so clever. Except the face that it reconstructed was that of a white man. It's absolutely bizarre. And these people thought this was fantastic. But in fact, it is simply reproduce a, so many bits of AI because it's not diverse. You've probably seen the video of, you know, the white guy putting his hands under the under the tap and it goes off. The black guy puts his hand under there and it carries on running because the devices that they've, small, very low level AI devices they've got in there, the sensors, aren't made for a diverse uh, world. And I think that's one particular way uh, there's a petition going around at the moment. In fact, there's a set of researchers going back to physiognomy. They claim that they can tell what a criminal looks like and that the AI will do this for them. Well, there you go. I wonder what color those criminals are going to be in this strange AI world. So a lot of neuroscientists got very alarmed about this because clearly it's with face recognition, what governments could do. But of course, all that, the machines are in a way not responsible. They're doing it, but we built them, and they're reflecting our ideas and our culture in the same way as the, you know, our ideas about machines bleed into science. Less savoury ideas and prejudices that are in our culture also bleed into science and change the way we make things. Oh, thank you. I really like, I think you, you quote um, a Google researcher saying machine learning has become alchemy because it's not yeah. clear <laughs> what the algorithms are actually doing. <laughs> I really yeah, love that. that. That was at a big meeting a couple of years ago. <laughs> you think, well, I mean, that's great because I don't understand them. <laughs> so it's quite reassuring, but also rather alarming. So when you add that to the idea of, you know, autonomous uh, killing machines, you know, then you really do have to worry. And I, I, I don't, I'm not worried about the robots becoming conscious and deciding to take over and kill us all. I'm just worried about that last bit. I'm worried about them killing people. Uh, and it's the same with drones. So I think there is a, a lot of hard thinking about the ethics of AI and of science and of the way that we build such devices and the uses that they can be put to. Uh, I think we've got to do a lot of hard thinking about that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it's his conclusion uh, too. Um, but on, staying on the brain mapping for a moment, I've just seen that we've got um, a question from Gina Rippon. I didn't know she was in the house. Hello, Gina. Um, Hello, Gina. <laughs> I'll ask that in a moment. And um, But I just wanted to ask it because I was really fascinated by this idea in the book as well, is that, you know, one of these big problems about the thinking machine or the brain mapping or understanding, uh, you know, how to map the brain is, as you put it, where is not how. Yeah. Well, it's not, I, it's not my... No, I didn't make sorry. That up. It's a snappy <laughs> phrase. But it's not mine. But where is not how? Yeah. So if you have a map, it tells you where things are, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how they're working. It tells you how they're interrelated, perhaps. But uh, part of the problem is brains and nervous systems are so mind-bogglingly complicated that the kind of at a cellular level, we are. We, we are decades, maybe even more away from having a cell level map of the mouse brain, never mind a human brain, because they are so, you know, humans got 80, 90 billion neurons and a load of other cells and you've, loads of other cells. You've done a sea uh, sprint, haven't you? You've done a tiny sea creature. Yeah, there's a, there's a tiny sea creature, larval stage of a sea creature, which has got about, what, 517 neurons, something like that. So, uh, yeah, the mouse has got about 70 million. The maggot, which is what I study, the tiny Drosophila maggot, has got about 10,000. And uh, my colleagues uh, in Cambridge and in America and all over the world have been making the what's called the connectome of the maggot brain, or rather of a maggot brain, just one, because we know that maggots are different. Even if they are exactly the same genetically, even if they are exactly reared in the same conditions, then they have slightly different wiring diagrams. Uh, and working out what those cells are doing, how they're connected, and how they can produce behavior is, I, I mean, I think if, if in 50 years, we can model that, I, we can put all that information for those 10,000 neurons and all their multiple interconnections into a computer, and predict accurately what will happen if you you poke it, you give it a smell, you I don't know, you shine a light on it, all the kind of things that maggots are interested in. If you can accurately predict what it will do in 50 years, I will be amazed. It's that kind of level of dis. Normally, scientists say oh, we'll have it in five years. Cloning mammoths, five years, you'll see. But no, I'm being honest. I think that's half a century. And I have some colleagues who go, "Well, you're optimistic, aren't you?" And this is your this is your area as well. So fifty years to yeah. sort of vaguely understand how a maggot's brain works. Well, no, to fully understand it. I mean, we <laughs> vaguely understand it now. To fully, fully I mean, understand. to really, to completely understand it, I to be able to predict how it will respond in a given circumstance. Yeah, that's my my, my guesstimate. I say all that on the basis it's taken kind of ten years to get us where we are so far. But the map they're making, and this is the exciting point: the map they're making with uh, the maggot, and also with. Uh, increasingly now, including with mice, is that it is a functional map. So it enables you to say how it works because the same uh, methods you use, the same chemical re molecular reagents, genes that you use to show a particular structure, you can also then use to, to manipulate that structure. You can turn it on literally, say, at the flick of a switch. So colleagues in uh, Cambridge in particular have been really at the forefront of uh, developing this, producing astonishingly precise ways of not only describing the brain, but also of manipulating it and therefore coming up with hypotheses for how it's working. Oh, God, superb. Thank you, Matthew. I'm going to, I, I'm going to go to a couple of questions now because they are coming through thick and fast. Yeah, sure. um, a question from uh, Gina, as I said, Gina Rippon, one of our salon speakers. Hello, Gina. And she says, um, love your shirt. Matthew, which we all Thank do. You. Well done, Gina. <laughs> um, and she said, why do you think it is so hard to shift the idea that there are two types of brain, a female brain and a male brain? Yeah. So first thing, let's let's we all agree on this. There are not. You can't look at a scan. You can't look at any brain and say, oh, that's a gentleman's and that's a lady's. It doesn't work that way. You can't. You know, there's not that level of resolution. Now, I might part company from Gina in that. <laughs> Oh, Gina's uh, an expert, a neuroimager expert on her book is A Gendered Brain. It was definitely worth reading if you haven't read I, it. What, brains are different. All brains are different. My brain is different from Alan's. It's different from Gina's. It's different from everybody's who's watching. By definition, you know, we ha don't have the same personality. So the brains are wired differently because that's all our behavior and everything is. It's the way that things are connected in our, 
in our brain and the kind of soup of chemicals that's sloshing around in there. Now, humans are animals, and part of our past, and perhaps our present, will have been sexual selection in particular. So all sorts of factors, but in particular, sexual selection works very, very strongly. Um, and part of the problem with humans is disentangling the what looks like obvious differences. So, yeah, um, women are really choosy. Men will shag anything that they can get their hands on, right? So that's the kind of caricature, which, which does certainly correspond to some people I have met, especially the men. But that doesn't mean just because it looks that way doesn't mean to say that it's deep in our genes or whatever. And one of the examples I give to show the problem you've got about understanding what look like fixed and significant behaviors that they don't necessarily have a genetic basis is handedness. So your handedness, your left or your right handed, yeah? And it feels absolutely intrinsic. It's the way you are. It's very difficult to imagine be in any other way. You can, you know, if you're left-handed, you can make yourself use your right hand. And clearly that happened to a lot of people in the past. We got forced at school. But basically you are handed and it's, it's intrinsic to your nature. And yet there is no gene for handedness. There must be genetic components, but they are incredibly complicated. And instead it seems to be some kind of stochastic process that takes place and you emerge with this handedness. Now, I suspect that in our genes and maybe even in the structures of our brains, there are lurking fossils, remnants of our evolutionary past. There is in every other respect, so I don't see why it sh wouldn't be the case uh, for differences between men and women in particular, not so much because the shagging and choosing thing, but the more obvious thing is that women have babies. So there's a whole aspect of relationship with uh, the child that is of particular significance in women that men don't have. So I would be surprised if there weren't those traces. What they are and how significant they are, I have no idea. And I don't know how I would find out. So just looking and saying, well, all men are shaggers and women choose, that doesn't tell you anything except one, your preconceptions, and two, probably the very small sample size in time and space that you've looked at. Okay. Thank you, I don't know if Gina would agree with that. I was going to say, I wonder what Gina would say if she was here. I'll have to get the two of you together. Um, so um, thanks, Gina. I have another question from Nicholas. Hello, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Um, lovely question, Matthew. It says, um, thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, two questions. Which was your favourite science fiction brain in TV, film or books? <laughs> well, and or if you were to invent one, what would it look like? <laughs> uh, OK, so probably my, my favourite one is uh, one of the ones that wants to kill us or rather is so burdened by knowledge that it ends up murderous. And that's HAL 9000 from uh, 2001. Uh, and I think I I mean, I saw it when it first came out in 1968. Uh, and there's spoiler here. There's a scene at the end. So basically the computer has knowledge which nobody else on the ship has. It's been told things and it becomes increasingly paranoid and untrustworthy uh, of humans. And so it becomes, in a way, it's more human than most of the people. One of the bizarre things about the film is that emotion, it's very flat. All of the humans are very kind of on screens, whereas the computer has actually got real feelings. <laughs> And it gradually, yeah, does terrible things. So that would be mine. And in particular, I was struck by, there's an image at the end in which he, he has to, well, the surviving astronaut has to turn it off. And he does this by floating about. It's all done brilliantly with special effects. And there are these fantastic perspex memory, perspex, colored perspex memory modules that kind of weightlessly glide up. And the poor computer gradually loses its memory until all it can do is remember the very first thing that it did when it was first turned on in about 1982 or something, uh, which was to sing Daisy, Daisy. And in a kind of typical Kubrickian moment, it's this, this, this pathetic song, like the use of um, We'll Meet Again at the end of uh, Doctor Strangelove. So that struck me as a, as a, as a preteen seeing this. I thought, God, that's amazing. Uh, so I think if I was going to build one, I'd, I'd build a HAL 9000, but not one that was going to kill me because... But, it, I mean, how he got a it was a bad rap. They shouldn't have told him all that stuff. He would have been fine. <laughs> well, thanks, Matthew. You don't know what I'm talking about. You've got to go and watch the film. It's extraordinary. That's right. And we've got a list of things to do after our talk. Um, <laughs> got a question from Laura. Hello, Laura. How are you? Um, fantastic talk, Matthew. I'm looking forward to reading your book, which uh, please buy from us. We're an independent bookseller. It's got gold on it. Gold, gold real gold. Yeah. 
It's lovely end papers. Beautiful end papers. It's got, pictures, it's got pictures in it. Look, there's pictures, there's diagrams. Lots of diagrams. Colour plates, all, all sorts of stuff. The whole year's from 1600 to 1819 it nice. building. Oh, it smells lovely. <laughs> It does beautifully. A work of, a, a thing of beauty. <laughs> um, and she said, um, given the fascination in ageing aging and extending life, is it the brain that packs up in all a, old age or the body? And any tips for happy brain longevity? Ha, huh, um, well, brain longevity and uh, is, I, there's no guarantee of it. I mean, I think most of the, I'm, I'm not a medic, you know, I only know about maggots really. Mm -hmm. So We can learn uh, a lot my, from maggots. Well, yeah, but the thing about maggots is they're turning into something else. So they don't actually, they're supposed to get old in a good way. Um, so uh, aging, I think, firstly, you know, if, if you're older, then you do lots of mental exercise. I mean, that's a, it's a strange way of thinking about it. But yes, doing all the evidence seems to be that doing puzzles, learning lang new language, thinking about things, all that is going to help. Um, I think it very much depends on the individual. Clearly, some people have in particular with neurodegenerative diseases uh, or mini strokes, which is what happened to my mother. Uh, so it was a bit like HAL 9000, to be honest. You know, she gradually lost, she didn't recognize me. And then it all went back until she was, you know, G Joni Foster living in Dagenham in 1935. And that, that was all that there was really left of her. So uh, in neurodegenerative diseases or, uh, strokes like that then you have those very it's clearly the brain that is causing the, 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 the a lot of the problems but there's going to be an interaction with the body because the brain is in the body um but i think the ultimate we don't know why we die i mean and all animals do we don't know why we get we die when we get old and there's lots of talk about you know telomere shortening that's part of the chromosomes and so on uh but i think basically it's the body and whilst you might think well, why don't we upload ourselves? And there's lots of people who've had their heads uh, cryopreserved, <laughs> stuck in liquid nitrogen in some farm in Arizona. Don't waste your money, folks. It's not going to happen. But I think if we go back to your, your AI, AI man uh, saying, yeah, it'd have to be the size of a planet. Well, you know, how many planets have we got to build a computer that big, you know? So my brain's going to be in there, not yours. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's just not going to happen. And if you think about the uploading business that we think about, you know, uploading your brain to a, a device that's the you know a, a standard trope of science fiction in fact we this is a pre-scientific notion of the mind as a spirit as a set of you know as a thing that you could actually capture and you might want to get all science and say okay well you know actually we're talking about uh, states of neurons and their interactions and we can represent it all as zeros and ones but the brain isn't digital neurons aren't digital that's not the way they work so um I think I'm not I think we've just got to get used to getting old and do it as ungracefully as possible. Um, you know, rage against it and do outrageous things, wear purple, uh, as that poem had it. I think that's a bit passe these days. Uh lovely but anyway, shirts. You know, <laughs> lovely shirts, whatever. I'm not that old. Uh <laughs> lovely shirts, read stuff, think stuff, learn learn new skills, musical instruments, stuff like that. That's what that would be my advice. Pretty hopeless, but it's not going to do you any harm. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of neurogenesis. Um, I, I've got a question from the salon team, and um, this is something we were asking around, trying to think, okay, what metaphors do we believe about the brain? What, which are the kind of like dominant ones that we really, we really do kind of, uh, you know, wholeheartedly believe? And one of the biggest ones that kept coming up is, and we hear this time and time again, and we believe it, is this idea that we have this reptilian brain, this admit. Oh, uh, I know the amygdala this idea that there's some part of our brain that is that drives our basis instincts and that that we're powerless in its um demands uh, you well, know that, yeah I, I, yeah and that's what it feels like so that tells you why we believe that nonsense because it's what it feels like you know i've got to buy that pair of shoes i you know if i'm an addict i have to have my cup of coffee or my fix of whatever recreational drug I'm addicted to. And that's what being in a body feels like. It's you're interacting with all these emotions and these feelings. And you can't just, you know, you're not just a digital state. You are part of your body. And that's why the nonsense about the reptilian brain, which, you know, neuroscientists never, never bought into. Um, it was done, developed partly by a, a um, by a, 
a neuroanatomist um, and he wrote a book and then uh, Kersler wrote a book about it and then uh, Sagan wrote an awful book called The Dragons of Eden. I've got some quotes from it. Which, I mean, I got so furious. What a load of rubbish. Um, but there is no reptilian brain. And it, I mean, and the bits of, and the idea that reptiles are stupid anyway. Wait a minute, birds, birds, you know, you know, Caledonian crows, which are a kind of reptile, they've got that reptilian brain. Caledonian crows can make tools to make tools. You know, how most mammals haven't got the foggiest about, you know, show my cat a tool and it's got no idea. It knows that I opened the cans with a can opener, but it couldn't make a can opener to save its life. So birds are pretty damn smart and they've got reptilian brain. But I think the reason why we like it and we buy into it is the same reason that we accepted the chemical imbalance ideas about neurotransmitters, which links to the idea of depression, anxiety, uh, and this dominant metaphor that you you know you've got you've got to rebalance your system. I mean, I have a quote in the book from uh, Richard Burton, not not that Richard Burton, and not Richard Burton, the explorer from the 19th century, the other Richard Burton who wrote a book about melancholy, about depression in the 17th century. And I've got the quote. And if you just spruce up the English and you take away his stuff, which is all about the four humours you know, black bile and all that stuff, and you put in serotonin and dopamine, it reads like something you'd read today. And really what we've got with those ideas about, um, about chemical imbalance is we're back with the four humours, Galen's ideas, uh, and it works because it feels that way. And it must be said for some people, those drugs do work. So part of the mystery and the chapter on chemicals and on mental health is a bit depressing for that reason because <laughs> we don't understand how any of it works. There are some drugs that do work. We're very confident about lithium for treating uh, manic phases of, of schizophrenia, for example, can work incredibly well. But most of the drugs we've marketed have had a you know great big boom period in which we got very, very excited about them. And then we've realized they don't really work in the way we thought they did, or maybe they're having terrible side effects. So at the moment, everything's very fashionable. Uh, people are are taking ketamine. Ketamine's back on the market, not for clubbing, but in the K-hole, but for dealing with depression. Uh, and maybe it's it's going to help some people. Uh, similarly, microdosing of LSD is people are quite interested in that. It does sound quite a lot, quite a bit of fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, make sure you do it in a somewhere it's legal, folks. Um, but ultimately, we don't really understand the chemistry of the brain. It is incredibly complicated, and these are all. The, the reason why they, they they attract us is because I go back to this idea because we are brains in bodies and it feels that way. You know, the, the addict has the monkey on the back. You are impelled to do something despite knowing you shouldn't, especially with kind of bad habits. So it feels that way, but there's not a lot of evidence that it really is that way. Yeah, I found the um, I'm, I, I'm really I found the chapter on chemistry that you've just been talking about so so moving it really did um blow my mind you know because there is that you know as you've just explained you know we don't really understand research and genetics hasn't really given us the answer between um you know the drugs that we are we're we're using for uh, mental disorders uh, and their effectiveness as you've just explained and i think it's you know it's sorry yeah just just one there's one word of warning Right. If anybody listening is taking any medication for whatever reason, don't listen to me and stop taking it. Right. Go and talk to your physician. I'm not a physician. I'm not qualified in any way, shape or form to give you any advice. Talk to your physician. And certainly if you're on SSRIs, you should not stop taking them like that because you will have a terrible crash. And it's awful. So you need to talk to your physician, discuss it with them and come to a, a solution that you both agree on. Yes. And um, and your chapter is a really interesting way of reading around the subject as well. I think it's um, and you make that very clear in that chapter as well. Um, now, we haven't got a huge amount of time left. Um, do you, I'd like to ask you about um, um, I'd like to ask you about um, using data to uh, understand the brain mm -hmm. or the use of MRIs. <laughs> Okay, fMRI. So these are the things where the brain lights up. In yes, particular. the whole idea of the brain lighting up. I've been to so many talks where we have seen yeah. brains lighting up in the F, is it FRMI. FMRI, FMRI. So, I mean, 
the point is there's a lot of neuroscientists doing fantastic work on this but it's like it, Gina. It, it's very it's very it's very attractive people love it you get bits of the brain lighting up the brain does not light up this is simply how it's represented on a computer screen but there have been a whole series of repeated problems with the field which have been revealed by people working in the field uh firstly you may remember the dead salmon uh, so the dead salmon, this was when they put a salmon into a scanner and they showed it some photos and they asked it some questions about what it thought about the photos, its opinions. Uh, and whilst it was thinking about this, they measured which bricks of its brain were lighting up. And of course, this is just an artifact because the salmon was dead. I mean, it, it, let's just be clear, it wasn't doing anything. And it was a satirical paper. Um, then later on, uh, they realized that the uh, the algorithms they were using to devise to work out which of the bits lighting up they should pay attention to and which they should ignore. Those were all wrong and people got very worried about that. Most recently, there was a big study in which they gave, I think, about 15 leading uh, fMRI groups uh, the same data. And they said, right, we've done this experiment. We've asked somebody to sat in a scanner and think about something, analyze it. Which bits of the brain are lighting up? And they all came to a different conclusion. So the field needs to get its act together, and they're trying to do this and say, you know, design your experiments, make your predictions before you start, so you don't go fishing around and end up with something because it's, uh, you know, it just happens to be significant. But I, I just want to do one, give one fact, right? And this is what I, I, I didn't believe this. In fact, it's got an asterisk at the bottom of the page which says, yes, these figures are correct. So. In the smallest unit of one of those images you see in the, in the papers or on the website, the smallest unit, the voxel it's called, then in that unit you have five and a half million neurons, uh, up to 5.5 times 10 to the 10, so that's 10 billion synapses, 22 kilometers of dendrites, that's the input part of a neuron, and 220 kilometers of output and so when that bit of the brain is lighting up as somebody who works on neurons actual single cells i've no idea what that means furthermore fmri can't tell you whether that bit of the brain is being turned on or turned off and inhibition is one of the fundamental features of the computations that the brain does do because though it's not a computer it's certainly computing things as it processes and as it does this astonishing thing called thought which we haven't talked about at all but there's a chapter on consciousness and no i've no idea how it works i mean but i don't know how the brain works at all my publisher uh in the middle of the book writing the book he said to me but well how does it work you've got to have an answer i said i have no idea he said you can't say that they want an answer readers will want to know and apart from one grumpy person on amazon who said it was a lot of rubbish because i didn't explain the brain uh i think in general people are quite satisfied that I'm telling the truth. We have no idea. It's been really well reviewed by neuroscientists. <laughs> yeah, they've generally been, generally been okay with it. Well, I'm glad that we've sorted that because consciousness is obviously known as the hard problem, right? Because it's hard. It's hard. But you've solved no it idea. by saying we've got no idea. So we don't have to worry about that. And if we've got 50 years to understand, <laughs> to map the maggot's brain, then we really don't have to worry about consciousness just yet. Yeah. Francis Crick, who's responsible for a lot of the modern interest in consciousness by neuroscientists, philosophers have always been interested in it quite rightly. I mean, you know, philosophers, there's a bit of philosophy bashing, I'm afraid, in the book, but, you know, they can take sucker from the fact that they've been worrying about this for whatever, three, five thousand years, and they don't know, but we don't know either, so that's okay. Uh, but, yeah, we don't know how, how the brain works, but we there are various... Uh, ways forward that I outline in the book and different options. I don't think it's a, an impossible uh, task. Crick thought we would understand maybe attention, elements of consciousness by the end of the 21st century. Not looking good, I don't think. I really liked. I, I really like Crick's idea that you mentioned that the you know the brain's been constructed by a series of steps, each one yeah. not perfect but adequate. But we can't yeah. seem to Crick. help. But presume that it's all been done to the best possible of its ability yeah they they i mean the point about evolution is it's just got to be good enough it doesn't good have enough. to be perfect <laughs> yeah. we don't we don't we know it's not engineered because it's full of crap and garbage i mean like our genes it's all the kinds of nonsense in there and that's that's our our legacy that's our past that's our evolutionary past and the fact that you know an adaptation is not perfect 
And you've only got to look at the skeleton of the human body to realize that, you know, we have not been designed at all. We have evolved, we've adapted. We've got these little bits that work just well enough and maybe we can turn them into something else and they become something else over big depths of time. The same is true of the brain. Okay, thank you so much. So to summarize, we don't know anything. Um... That's right. <laughs> but it's fun finding out. <laughs> It's great to look back at history. We can know what we knew at times and what became true. Yeah. We don't have to worry about consciousness. And you've written the most... Well, yeah, not very yet. Interesting. It's yeah, really interesting. Um, and you've written the most gorgeous book <laughs> called A Masterpiece by our friend, uh, Dr. Adam Rutherford. We love at Salon. We've loved so much talking to you, Matthew. Um, I you feel we, we could do a 12-hour salon on your book. I really do think so. Easily. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much, buddy. Everybody, stay safe. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for um, joining us for our the idea of the brain with the Matthew Cobb. Um, I hope to see you at a salon very soon. Um, this salon is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>